Hello, excellent honors biologists. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this chapter. I think it's kind of an easy peasy one. Chapter 34 is the nature of ecosystems. And the first part that we're gonna talk about and is in this video right here is about the biotic components of ecosystems. So remember how we talked about abiotic and biotic. So abiotic is non, living right and so biotic is living so we're just going to focus on those living components of ecosystems the second topic is about remember how nutrients cycle but energy flows so we're going to talk about how energy flows through the biotic components of an ecosystem and that will be the end of this video part one right sounds pretty easy then the next video part two chapter 34 is Remember, nutrient cycle, energy flow. So we're going to talk about those biogeochemical cycles, and that will be part two. All right. So if you're watching this, you want to have your group shared notes out. If you're watching this on YouTube, I have put the group shared notes down at the bottom in the whatever section below uh, the video. So it's right in there, um, the description of the video. You can have access to them as well. I want to remind you. Column one is the scaffolding, so you want to fill in. I made little yellow highlighty areas where you need to fill in the notes. Column two, flip a pic. You're putting pictures in there, right? And then remember, if there's anything I talk about, like you're like, what? Then that's where you want to put a comment to yourself so that when we do the debrief in class, you can ask me those questions, all right? I'm already proud of you. I know you're going to do a great job. I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller, and I'm going to go ahead and go in presentation mode. Look, I'm in the middle of the screen. I didn't mean to be that. All right. So um, this is chapter 34, the nature of ecosystems. And the first part that we're looking at right here is you're looking at the whole ecosystem. Remember, see if you can fill in the blanks for me, right? It's population is a group of similar organisms. And then a community is going to be multiple populations. And then the ecosystem right that takes into consideration the environment right so that's your total ecosystem abiotic factors in the second picture you can see sunlight temperature precipitation non-living things um and how and obviously that's going to have an impact on who can live what and where right like you're not going to have a tropical plant in the desert right and then biotic factors, if you look at the bottom over here, let me get my pointer. If you look at the bottom over here, you've got autotrophs, producers, and you've got heterotrophs, consumers. What they're not showing you right here um, really is like decomposers. So those are biotic factors in a community. All right, so here's an ex some examples of producers. You have really small, tiny ones, or you could have large trees that are producers. So what I want you to have on your notes is under the introduction, it says all ecosystems include abiotic, non-living components such as the atmosphere, water, and soil, and biotic, living components. All right, and then I'll, I'll get you caught up here. Then the other part is biotic components are either, so autotrophs or producers, they require only an inorganic nutrients, they require only inorganic nutrients and an outside energy source and an outside energy source to produce organic nutrients for their own use and for all other members of their community. And then, Heterotrophs or consumers need preformed organic materials um, that they can use as energy. All right, so that's the that's why producers are so important because they can take the inorganic and turn it into organic materials, and then consumers they will use those organic materials right as their source of energy. So again, you could have really small um, microscopic plants. Um, and they are some of the biggest producers here on our planet, okay? Um, they capture the energy and they make it available for all members of the food web. And we'll be talking about food chains and food webs here. So very small algae, big green plants. Obviously, I'm trying to really talk about that. Now, not all um, autotrophs 
are photoautotrophs. The ones I showed you before all use light energy to take the inorganic CO2 and make it organic. But chemoautotrophs, they get their source of energy from breaking bonds. Like if you've ever been to a natural hot springs and it smells like rotten eggs, that's because those bacteria are breaking the bonds between hydrogen and sulfur and using that energy in order to reduce CO2 into glucose. So those are chemoautotrophs. All right, so on your notes, let's get your notes caught up. Underneath populations of an ecosystem, we have producers, they are photosynthetic, and they use chlorophyll and light to do photosynthesis, use chlorophyll and light to do photosynthesis. And I gave you some main producers there that we looked at, pictures, algae in the water and green plants on land. And then chemoautotrophs, these are bacteria that obtain energy from the oxidation oxidation of inorganic compounds. Oxidation, when you oxidize something, you're releasing the energy out of that. Um, it is found, they could be found in hydrothermal vents and caves. That would be another place you could find them. All right, good. All right, so I gotta make myself smaller. Smaller, be smaller. All right, so this next part here that we're looking at is, that you can see we need a source of preformed organic materials. We can't just stand outside and go, oh, I want some energy, right? So what we need to do, okay, as heterotrophs, we can't make our own food. And so we have to feed on other organisms. And, and it doesn't, there's all different types of heterotrophs, but collectively they're called consumers. Now, another type of heterotroph that is not a consumer is a decomposer, and we'll be talking about those two. So the big umbrella, okay, big umbrellas, you are either a producer, right? Producer, you're like a plant, right? But you can be, um, that would be an autotroph. A heterotroph, you could be a consumer or a decomposer. So you are an example, okay, of a heterotroph. That's you. Okay, you need to go out there and consume those nutrients. So um, here, at the lowest level of consumer, a primary consumer is called an herbivore, right? So you're thinking they're eating herbs, right? But not just like a lot of times people just think of like leaves or something like that, but look at all the things they could be eating. Grass, flowers, seeds, root, fruits, bark, pollen, and much more. So these are all examples of herbivores. So on your notes though, Herbivores are primary consumers. They're the first type of consumer. And you could say they eat plants and then maybe throw in a few more on there, maybe seeds or bark or pollen, right? Specific parts of the plant, okay? And here you can see some herbivores. They feed only on producers. So herbivores only eat producers like plants. So here are a couple of um, herbivores, also rabbits, elephants, those are also herbivores. Okay, here's some other herbivores, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, now let's level up and let's talk about carnivores. So carnivores, they are gonna eat meat, okay? So they kill and eat other animals and there are some examples there. They are considered, if they eat an herbivore, okay, they are considered a secondary consumer if they eat an herbivore. So carnivores, secondary consumers, eat animals, eat animals. Now, okay, so let's go over that. A primary consumer eats plants, a secondary consumer eats herbivores, a tertiary consumer, do you know what that would eat? Do you know? they would eat other carnivores, right? A tertiary consumer, we would be kind of leveling up. So a secondary consumer, you're just eating herbivores. So right here, this spider is eating this herbivore. This, um, I don't know what he is, is eating this fish, okay? I don't know specifically what he is, sorry. But he's eating this fish, this fish eats algae. So the algae, the algae was the producer, the fish is the primary consumer, and this bird is the secondary consumer. All right, same thing here, right? See if you can identify all the things. I'm probably asking you some Ed Puzzle questions. Here, here, here. All right, hopefully you got all those right. Okay, now if you take, oh, that was just a little joke. All right, 
Here we have a tertiary consumer, and that would be the snake. The tertiary consumer is eating the primary consumer, which is the frog, okay? The primary consumer could eat a fly, okay? Um, and that fly could be an herbivore if he ate plant material, all right? So we can level and stack those up. So again, I don't have a picture of a fly in here, okay? <laughs> if I could draw a fly in here. So or whatever else he ate, okay? So the grass would be the producer, the fly would be the primary consumer, the frog would be the secondary consumer, and then the tertiary consumer would then be the snake. And you usually, generally, you don't go much higher than that because you just can't get enough energy from it. All right, so on your notes, you already have that. A tertiary consumer eats other carnivores that have eaten an herbivore. Right, and I'm probably asking you some Ed puzzle questions here. Question, question, question. All right. Um, now let's move on um, to omnivores. So omnivores, they can eat multiple things. Okay, so they will eat plant material and um, they will eat animal material. So you biologically are considered an omnivore. You may choose to be a vegetarian, you may choose to be a carnivore, but biologically speaking, you are an omnivore. The reason why I know that is by your dentition, you have these sharp um, canines for cutting and tearing flesh, and you have broad molars in the back, for grinding plant material and breaking cell walls. I also know by the length of your intestines, your gut, okay? Because if you were a, if you were biologically a carnivore like a lion, your intestines can be much shorter because it's easier to digest animal material than plant material. If you were primarily a vegetarian, if you were biologically um, a vegetarian, then your intestines would have to be a lot longer in order to accommodate that. We have an intermediate, which means that we would be an omnivore. Again, what you choose to eat is up to you. By the way, I made this cake right there. I really like it. And these two little girls are my nieces, but they're older now. All right, so, what am I? I am sure I am Ed puzzling you right now. And hopefully you got all those questions right. Okay, so moving on, um, let's talk about decomposers. So decomposers eat dead, um, dead things or they consume them. Sometimes they can be parasitic, right? Like if you've ever had athlete's foot, then you've got a fungus growing, eating part of your foot there. Um, it could be the dead skin cells or actually living. They could be penetrating. But for the most part, we're eating dead plants and materials. You're returning those nutrients back to the soil ultimately. So decomposers will break down any living thing. That is what their job is. So I want you to put down on your notes, fungi, bacteria, break down dead organic material, and they use enzymes to do that. They use enzymes to do that, right? So here are some examples, bacteria, okay, and fungi are both decomposers. Now, detritivores, detritivores are a category of decomposers and a little subcategory, and they eat decomposing material called detritus, and this detritus could be poo and pee. It could be at the bottom of a cave. Here you can see a dung beetle right over here. Um, so they can be bacteria, worms, or crabs. So it's just, they kind of break down those kind of nitrogenous decomposing wastes. All right, um, I can't click on this worm right now to show you that, but um, in we, I will show you that video in class. So here are some other examples of decomposers. All right, now um, you, like I said, okay, you are a, do you remember what you are? What you're considered? Okay, so hopefully you said you were an omnivore, right? Okay, so one thing, let me can change the slide here. When you want to study an ecosystem, then what you want to do is look to see how the energy flows through that ecosystem and how they meet their nutritional needs. So we want to follow the flow of energy. So the next section in your note says energy flow and chemical cycling. So 
Energy obviously always starts from the sun. The big yellow one is the sun. So that's what you want to put on your notes. Energy, it starts with the sun's energy. Then who's going to capture the sun's energy? What would you say? Hopefully you chose that autotrophs can capture the sun's energy. So here we can see solar energy. We're going in here to the autotrophs. These green ones right here are definitely doing photosynthesis, photosynthesis so they are photoautotrophs. And then you can see the energy moving through consumers. Primary consumer would be this bunny because he eats the plant material. And then this fox could eat the bunny, so he would be a secondary consumer. If this was, uh, if something came in ate the fox, that would be a tertiary consumer, right? And then decomposers are going to work on both the producers, so that's why you have an arrow of this of the nutrients going from the producers to the decomposers and also from these animals to the decomposers they're going to break that down and then we can reuse that right because nutrients will cycle through okay the energy it's going to get passed along the way but remember every single time we lose a little bit of that as heat so what i mean by that is if the bunny gets eaten by the fox, right? Not all of the energy that was in that bunny is gonna get um, passed on to the fox. You're gonna lose a little bit every time. In fact, it's predicted that approximately, and it depends on the energy system that you're looking at, only about 10% moves on, all right? So on your notes, you have energy flow starts with the sun's energy next to autotrophs and then next to heterotrophs. So next to autotrophs and heterotrophs, eventually it will dissipate as heat. So when we're looking at this energy here, eventually it dissipates as heat. And I, when I said think of thermodynamics, um, two laws we're gonna talk about in thermodynamics is first of all, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes forms like who has it. And so the energy is starting here with the sun. We're not getting any more energy than what is already in the sun. Um, and then the second law of thermodynamics is every time it changes, you lose some as heat. Okay, and then chemical cycling, those are the gray arrows. It starts with producers taking in inorganic nutrients. So if you look right here, right, it starts with the producers. The energy flow starts with the sun, but the nutrient flow is always gonna start with your producers taking in those inorganic nutrients. Chemicals will be recycled and used again and again. And in our second video on this chapter, that's when we'll talk about those biogeochemical cycles and how carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and water all move through our systems. All right, so that was 34.1 the biotic components of ecosystems. And then the next part that we're gonna talk about is energy flow where we're just focusing on how energy moves through the system. So here you are looking at a food chain. This right here is not supposed to be an orange. Any guesses what that is? Hopefully you said the sun, exactly. So this is the sun, just not drawn to scale, otherwise this would be terrifying. Okay, so you can see it's moving through this food chain. One thing I want you to notice is if you look at the food chains right here, the way the arrow goes, okay, follow these arrows. As this frog is gonna be consumed by the snake, think of the way the arrow is, is that the food is going to that one like it's a mouth. Think about the snake's mouth, right? And the frog, that's how you draw those arrows, all right? So a food chain is a single path of energy flow a single path of energy flow, all right? So a food chain represents the flow of energy. So here, here it is, and we can look at this one. I'm sure I'm gonna ask you an Ed Puzzle question about this. Question, question, hopefully you got it right. All right, a food web is more realistic than a food chain because it shows all the interconnections, right? So when you look here, right, does the snake only eat frogs? No, he eats mice too, right? So kind of all the interacting food chains, that is a food web, and that's more representative in an ecosystem. So a food web you want to have on your notes, these are various interconnecting paths of energy flow. Various interconnecting paths of energy flow. Now, 
keep in mind, not only are nutrients flowing through here, right? Nutrients are flowing through here, but energy is flowing through here as well. Now, um, when you look at a food web, notice, oh, here, let's take, sorry, one more moment. Look at here, producers. These are all primary consumers that we know as herbivores. These are secondary consumers that eat the herbivores. Here are tertiary consumers that are eating the secondary consumers, right? So who would be considered the first carnivore in this food web? Who would be considered the first carnivore who acts carnivorous? Okay, hopefully you got that right. Okay, these secondary consumers would be the first carnivore in this food web. Okay, these would be up one more, the tertiary consumer. And then if the hawk eats all of these, he would be a quaternary consumer. All right, so here let's look at another picture. So you're looking at all the possibilities. And what I'm wondering is, here would be an Ed Puzzle question. What happens if we remove the cricket? What happens if we remove the cricket? Okay, now hopefully what you figured out is by removing the cricket, right, maybe the flowers would grow better because the cricket wasn't eating them, right? Maybe the mouse would have less to eat because he doesn't have the crickets. Maybe the bird would have less to eat as a result of that. So maybe the bird would eat more ladybugs, right, because he doesn't have crickets to eat. Maybe the mouse would eat more, you know, um, more beetles because he doesn't have crickets to eat. So food webs, when you do one thing and take one member out, it has ripple effects through the entire food webs. So that's why I said it's complex relationships. There are complex relationships. Now, this would be more likely what you would see, you know, in a food web, very, very complicated. Now, when you look at this food web, Who's at the bottom that seems really important in this food web? Who is at the bottom who seems really important? Okay, hopefully you said the krill, right? Because everything kind of hinges on this krill. Look at all the organisms that are tied to the krill. Okay, um, now this is what would be called a grazing food web. If you think about grazers, maybe you think about cows, right? So. When you have a grazing food web, it begins with some sort of producer, some sort of photoautotroph, right? So here it's it's beginning with these producers and these organisms, these primary consumers, this is where they're getting their energy from. So on a grazing food web, it begins with leaves or stems and seeds eaten by herbivores. That would be a grazing food web. Okay, this is a detrital, and this is just a food chain and not a web. Why would I say this is a food chain and not a web? Any guesses? Hopefully you said because it's just a single pathway. I didn't show the interconnecting webs, but there are um, detrital food webs, but I just wanted to be clear, this one is represented as a chain. So here you're not starting with photoautotrophs, right? You are actually starting this food chain with detritus, like pee and poo, like at the bottom of a cave. So detrital begins with decaying matter, begins with decaying matter, and many times the detrital food web has the largest store of energy because it's all the dead things, all the dead things, okay? Or what the dead things made. So you can have in an ecosystem both a um, grazing, which you're seeing right here, a grazing food web and a detrital food web, and they can be all interconnected because you can see these overlap, so it's not one without the other. So grazing and digital food webs are connected. So for example, if the birds are feeding on the worms, then they're eating something from the digital food web. All right, so next we wanna take this, and I want you to see in this food chain, okay, typically, when you go from grasses to grasshoppers, they, and grasshoppers to snakes, only about 10% of the energy gets to the next level in the food chain, that's about it. And that's why you run out about four or five levels, you run out of energy. Now, when you wanna talk about levels in the food chain or food web, you call those trophic levels. 
trophic levels. So here, I this would be the grass would be at the first trophic level, the grasshopper at the second. Let me show you here. Okay. So the first trophic level is always going to be at the very bottom of your food chain. The second trophic level eats the first. The third trophic level eats the second. And sometimes the third trophic, like if it's an omnivore, they could always go down to the first as well. But this is just the um, the feeding levels where you're at. So on your notes, the trophic levels, the first is the primary producers, like what you see here. The second is all the primary consumers. The second trophic level is all the primary consumers. Okay, and these would be like herbivores. The third trophic level, this is all the secondary consumers. What would be another name for a secondary consumer? Hopefully you said carnivore, right? That would be a carnivore. So it's kind of like, where do you eat? I sometimes think of it as like trophic levels as a trough. So what trophic level do you eat at? If you are a vegetarian, if you're a vegetarian and that's all you ever eat is plants, what trophic level do you eat at? Hopefully you said the first trophic level, okay? Um, so though those trophic levels is just representing and then we're gonna do something with those trophic levels. We're gonna be stacking those trophic levels up and I'll show you how to do that here one more time. Let me show you another example of trophic levels. Take a look, okay? And so if, if you look at the trophic levels, notice here the oak tree, he's at the first trophic level. If the mouse right here, since he's eating the nuts from the oak tree or whatever, he would be considered at the second trophic level. This carnivore is at the third trophic level, all right? Okay, so now what we can do is we can stack those trophic levels on top of each other. Now. You would just say, right, I bet just logically if we go back here, okay, you're going to say, what do you think we have more of? Do you think we have more mice or do we have more snakes? Okay, if the snakes to stay alive need mice, hopefully there's more mice than there are snakes, right? And so when you stack them up, that's why they represent them like this in this ecological pyramid. Now this doesn't always work, right? Because if I did this purely on numbers, like they're doing it on numbers kind of here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven giraffes and only one lion, okay? Because as you move up through the trophic levels, you're gonna have fewer and fewer numbers. But we have to really look at different types of pyramids because for instance, you could have one tree that numbers wise, it has a million ants on it. So sometimes the way they represent that is not a pyramid of numbers, but a pyramid of mass, you know, because the mass of one tree would be larger, right, than the mass of those millions of ants. Or the best one yet is the pyramid of energy, is how much energy is at each level. Now, from what I talked to you about before, I've said it a couple times now, how many, this again would be an Ed Puzzle question, how much energy gets passed on each time? Do you remember? Hopefully you said 10%, right? So this would not be a good model right here. This would not be a good model because it's looking like maybe 80 or 90% is passed on based on the size of the pyramid. So my pyramid really should get a lot smaller each time. And it should get a lot smaller each time because only about 10% gets passed on. Because when you look at this creature, he's doing cellular respiration and releasing heat to the inner, uh, to the environment from running around. Um, he's peeing and pooing, right? He's reproducing. He, uh, he will die, obviously, and that'll go to detrital feeders. So only about, to the carnivores, you would say approximately 10% gets passed on. So when you look at your ecological pyramids, only 10% of the energy on average is incorporated into the next level. So that's why you usually only have three to four stacks in your pyramid, maybe five, okay? Now, another reason why this particular ecological pyramid um, is not well represented is something is missing. I see producers, I see consumers, like the giraffe and the lion, 
What is missing? Okay, hopefully you told me decomposers are missing. So that would be a second reason why being it represented like that, that it doesn't work really well. So on your, uh, your notes there, not always a good model because there's no place for decomposers because they would be at every level. Okay, so here's showing you another, um, another pyramid and you can see it's still not representing exactly right because only about 10% gets passed on. And you can just even tell by the numbers, 37 is not 10% of 809, okay? So they're not quite representing that well in that model, okay? So on types, um, there are exceptions to each of these. The numbers, you have decre decreasing numbers at each level. You already have that. If you look at biomass, Okay, which is what we're looking at here. It's based on weight and there is less mass at each level. Less mass clearly at each level. Okay, another example here. So you can see producers, herbivores, carnivores, and then the top carnivores. Okay, and then um, I'm getting there. Let's see. Here's another ecological pyramid. As a review, maybe I will ask you an Ed Puzzle question here. Okay, or maybe not, I don't know. Okay, so the last one I wanna talk about is the pyramid of energy because if you look at this, okay, this algae is producing a lot of energy. So this algae, if I just weighed them like a pyramid of biomass, it would weigh this much, right? And the herbivores, depending on it, could weigh this much, but the algae is so productive that we wanna look at it based on its amount of energy that it generates. So energy, a pyramid, a bio, a pyramid uh, based on energy content, you would mean that there was less energy at each level, less energy at each level. All right, okay, good job. So a stable ecosystem can remain indefinitely because the nutrients are getting recycled through that food chain, producer, consumer, decomposers, right? With a continual input of energy from the sun and that that get, gets passed up through the, the food pyramid, right? Now, the next video that we're gonna watch is we're just gonna, we're gonna, or that I will do is just based on those biogeochemical cycles and how carbon and phosphorus and water and nitrogen pass through living organisms. But for this one, that's it.